You might be wondering at this point when the rapture will take place. As I mentioned in the previous session, different students of the Bible have different answers to that question. Some believe the church will be raptured before the seven years of chaos and terror known as the tribulation. Others believe it won't be raptured until the middle of that period or even after the tribulation. I believe the church will be raptured before the tribulation. I, I say this for two reasons. First, Jesus compared the moment of the rapture to the rescues of Noah and Lot. Noah felt no raindrops. Lot felt no brimstone. In the same manner, Christ will emancipate his church before the danger becomes most urgent. I believe that the followers of Jesus will not feel the evil of the Antichrist. Second, in 1 Thessalonians 4.18, Paul urges us to encourage one another with these words that he has just given us about the rapture. But how can we be encouraged if we're going to endure the horrors of the tribulation? If that were the case, Paul would have said, warn one another, but he didn't. The rapture of the church is presented as a reason for comfort and assurance, not fear and anxiety. So, the rapture is the immediate answer to the question, what happens next? Of course, that leads to another question, what happens after the rapture? What is the next step after that event in God's plan for redemption? The answer depends on what you experience during the rapture. Those who remain on earth will soon thereafter enter that season of anarchy called the tribulation, and it will last for seven terrible years. There will be violence, famine, and plague on a level never before experienced in human history. We'll take a deeper look at those seven years in the next session. But for now, know that followers of Jesus will avoid the tribulation, and they will be taken by Jesus into paradise. So what happens next for us is the judgment seat of Christ. As Paul writes, we will all stand before God's judgment seat, all of us. Therefore, he adds in another place in scripture, we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Now, I know this sounds frightening, but it's important to understand this judgment is not a trial to discern whether we are innocent or guilty, saved or lost. That evaluation occurs during our lifetime on earth. No, the judgment seat of Christ is not about salvation, but about recognition. Salvation is based on Jesus' work for us. Rewards are based on our work for him. Our deeds do not contribute to our salvation, not one iota. That's a gift. Our deeds do, however, inform our recognition. In explaining these realities, the Apostle Paul drew on an image that was familiar to his original readers. After each contest in the Greek games, which were similar to our Olympic games, the players stood before the bima, which was an elevated seat on which the judge or emperor sat. And there the winner of the event received the crown or laurel of reward. Now those who failed to win the race were not punished or cast out. They simply received no commendation. And so it will be at the judgment seat of Christ. Believers will be equally saved, but not equally rewarded. Max, you may be asking, what kinds of rewards are we talking about? Well, Paul gives us a hint in his first epistle to the Christians in Corinth. Do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize. Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. 
and they do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. In the first century, athletes were given a laurel of woven vines and withered wild celery. Paul rightly called this a corruptible crown or a crown that will not last. We, on the other hand, will receive an incorruptible crown or a crown that will last forever.